Welcome back, Cotoliner. Today we have the pleasure to have as guest the Chao Collective, that is a diaspora Chinese media collective that's trying to fight and to challenge the US cultural, economic and political aggression on China. They seek to be a bridge between the US left and China's rich Marxist, anti-imperialist political work and thoughts. Uh, in order to foster critical consideration uh, of the role of China and socialism today. Um, they also have recently published a report called uh, Taiwan, an anti-imperialism resource that you can find on their website and in which they try to fight the Western propaganda on Taiwan and to demonstrate the strong cultural and historical relationship between um, China and Taiwan. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you very much to Chao Collective for your work and for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Alessandro, and to everyone at Otolina TV. And, and um, yeah, uh, glad to be speaking with you today. Thank you, thank you. Um, so on the light of your uh, last report uh, on Taiwan, uh, uh, what do you think are the key historical steps uh, in understanding the current political uh, situation between uh, China and Taiwan? Yeah, so I guess I want to start out by uh, noting that the uh, resource itself has a very, very extensive timeline, um, uh, possibly too long to be read in one sitting. So uh, I, I assume that in the in the uh, caption for this video, you'll be providing the link. We, you know, definitely encourage all of your viewers to go to that and read it in full because it has a lot more detail than I can really cover today. But um, with that said, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and touch on some of the key uh, historical developments that are necessary for really understanding where we're at today with regards to, um, you know, cross-strait relations. Uh, because this is a history that is systematically um, erased and misrepresented by almost all mainstream Western media. So um, yeah, with that said, um, the timeline uh, covers, you know, a good amount of the history prior to the 1600s, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna cover that very briefly, right? Uh, you know, we have this history of, uh, settlement of Taiwan by its indigenous peoples who came from the Chinese mainland thousands of years ago, and then a brief but impactful period of Dutch and Spanish colonization in the early 1600s. Um, and through all this, uh, you know, some several successive waves of early Chinese migration. Um, you know, th there remains sort of an active debate about whether this can be considered an act of colonization in and of itself. You know, uh, our position is that it was qualitatively different and much less violent. But leaving that to one side, the you know fact is that by the late 1600s, Taiwan was indisputably part of Qing Dynasty China, and it was universe, universally recognized as such by all the other nations. Um, and it remained that way uh, through the 1800s. Uh, during that century, it became a target of uh, United States and especially Japanese imperial designs. This was uh, a period during which the Qing Dynasty entered uh, a period of terminal decline uh, that, that is now known as the Century of Humiliation. So, you know, it lost multiple um, wars uh, in humiliating fashion uh, against uh, various coalitions of Western imperialist powers. Uh, it suffered from tremendous internal unrest. Um, and this culminated with China's loss to Japan in the First Sino-Japanese War of 1895. As a consequence of which Taiwan, um, as a consequence of which Japan forced China to uh, cede Taiwan uh, as a colony, and Japanese colonial rule then lasted from 1895 to 1945, so 50 years. And uh, this period is uh, itself also uh, pretty historically contested. Um, Japan tried to present its rule as. Uh, in, more enlightened than that of Western imperial powers. There are times when it tried to present uh, Taiwan to the outside world as something of a model colony. But what this really masked was um, brutal repression of anti-colonial resistance uh, by both Han Chinese and uh, especially by 
the indigenous people of the island. Um, there were various anti-colonial movements uh, that emerged during this period um, that were predominantly of left nationalist or socialist or communist character. Uh, you know, under Japanese colonialism, there was a Taiwanese People's Party, a Taiwanese Communist Party, um, all which emerged in, in various ways to, uh, to, you know, combat Japanese colonial rule and which were uh, heavily inspired by the contemporaneous developments in mainland China, especially uh, the revolution of 1911, which ended dynastic rule and established the Republic of China. And then um, later the founding of the Communist Party of China in 1921. Um, you know, during this period, uh, Taiwan was rapidly industrialized, but uh, Japan did so basically in order to serve its, uh, you know, uh, extractive and militarily expansionist interests, especially uh, in the lead up to World War II um, and the Second Sino-Japanese War, uh, which was launched by Japan in 1937. And at a social level, in preparation for this, uh, Japan basically created uh, a cadre of, of collaborators within within Taiwan, and it uh, initiated uh, a very forceful assimilation policy, where um, predominantly uh, uh, Han uh, Chinese people in Taiwan, you know, were given sort of new Japanese names, were uh, you know uh, encouraged or coerced to. Uh, adopt the Japanese language, basically, you know, uh, fully become subjects of the emperor. And this included large scale recruitment and or conscription during the war into the Imperial Japanese Army. So this takes us to the end of World War II, the defeat of Japan in 1945, uh, when Taiwan was returned to Chinese sovereignty, this time uh, under the, uh, uh, the, the rule of the Kuomintang or the Nationalist Party. Uh, in the form of the Republic of China, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the return of, of Taiwan to Chinese sovereignty was initially welcomed uh, largely by the population, but, you know, the rule of the KMT, of the Kuomintang uh, in Taiwan displayed all the same uh, corrupt and dictatorial features as it did in mainland China during the time. So there was a large scale uprising, um, uh, the 228 uprising, so-called, because it happened on February 28, 1947, which was uh, heavily repressed in Taiwan. The quite strong underground communist movement was also highly repressed. And, uh, you know, you had the KMT bringing to Taiwan uh, a new stratum, basically, of mainland-born uh, soldiers and administrators who formed uh, the basis of what's called the Weishenren population, um, meaning uh, people from outside the province. Uh, this is in contrast to the Bengshenren, uh, who were um, basically Chinese people in Taiwan whose ancestors had migrated before 1945. And so this was, um, you know, uh, a marked cultural difference, right, um, that, that in many ways served to obscure the class distinctions that were there. Um, but in any case, uh, all of these dynamics uh, strengthened tremendously in 1949 when the KMT government imposed martial law on Taiwan and then was defeated by the Communist Party uh, in the Civil War um, and forced to retreat from the mainland to Taiwan, where they uh, uh, made Taipei the new provisional capital and continued to claim their authority over all of China, including the mainland from there. Um, they instituted a, uh, a regime called the White Terror that uh, imprisoned or executed almost all of the pro-unification communists left. <clears throat> and um, during uh, virtually the entirety of the Cold War, um, they basically turned Taiwan into a bastion of anti-communism, uh, both regionally and globally with the, the World Anti-Communist League, which was headquartered in Taipei. And uh, they converted as well into a launch pad for uh, United States aggression against both the People's Republic of China uh, and uh, and Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Um, and yeah, they continued to press their claim to mainland China even after uh, the ROC, the Republic of China, lost its UN seat to the PRC in 1971, and after uh, they lost United States recognition as the legitimate government of China in 1979 when it um, switched its recognition to Beijing instead. But this essentially culminated in the end of martial law 
1987. And that year also saw the legalization of the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, um, which is a pro-independence liberal party that essentially filled the political vacuum that had been left by the destruction of the pro-unification left under the white terror. And so they became the main political opposition during what's commonly referred to as Taiwan's democratization in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so this is a transition essentially from military dictatorship to uh, alternation of power between two bourgeois capitalist parties, uh, both of them very much anti-communist, um, and where the pro-independence party, the DPP, had an ideology that was fully aligned with uh, both U.S. imperialism and uh, nostalgia for Japanese colonialism. So this essentially takes us to where we are today when uh, in the context of um, escalating new Cold War aggression by uh, the United States against China, Taiwan has become one major front of that, uh, both in terms of propaganda and in terms of the, the level of uh, military funding that it's been receiving. Clear, clear. And uh, based on what you said, uh, um, how are nowadays the main uh, independence forces breeding uh, xenophobic and nationalistic uh, ideologies in Taiwan? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. This is a process that uh, really started in the 90s and has uh, accelerated since then. Um, during that period, there were several waves of revision to history textbooks, um, which were indicative of, of trends in the media and in broader society. And the intent of these revisions was to present Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan both before and after Japanese rule, that is to say under the Qing dynasty and then afterwards under the Republic of China as regimes that were equally colonial in nature to that of Japan and also more oppressive. Um, and you know what this did essentially was it relativized and it whitewashed the effects of Japanese colonialism. Uh, in fact, many uh, on the pro-independent side uh, actively celebrate what they consider the modernizing impacts of Japanese colonial rule, and they whitewash its brutality, especially towards uh, indigenous, uh, the indigenous population of Taiwan. And uh, the effect of this is that it, it constructs in a sort of artificial uh, Taiwanese identity uh, in distinction to that of China, right? Um, and which uh, the adherents of the anti of, of the pro independence camp consider to be inherently different and superior to that of China. Um, largely because of Taiwan's earlier industrialization, which happened not, you know, under the um, the terms of the Taiwanese people, right, but because of the dictates of Japanese colonialism, and then afterwards U.S. neo-colonialism. So this manifests culturally as chauvinism against mainland China, as the the sort of default assumption um, uh, by by many in Taiwan that it's inherently less developed than Taiwan. Um, uh, even as its rapid growth in, in recent decades has, uh, you know, made that objectively untrue. And at root, you know, uh, even though it tends to be uh, a little bit more socially progressive, right, um, than, than uh, uh, the, the Kuomintang, the KMT, it's just as anti-communist, right, um, possibly even more so. Because at the end of the day, the KMT uh, while conservative, they are Chinese nationalists and they're committed in theory to, to reunification and in practice to better cross-strait ties with mainland China, whereas um, the DPP and the independence camp more broadly uh, are actively antagonistic because of, you know, this entire process that, that uh, um, we talked about of de But uh, nowadays, uh, there is a strong and, and intense fighting between uh, those two cultural uh, points of view, uh, or it's now a low intense conflict, uh, and uh, it's a conflict that um, is, uh, is free to be fought also in the universities, also in the institutes, uh, uh, or uh, it's a conflict uh, and especially um, decides that thinks that uh, Taiwan uh, should be um, start a process of reunification is a, is in a way silenced or banned or something like that. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> it is still in many ways an active uh, debate within 
Taiwanese society, um, but one that has been very much uh, shaped in favor of the terms of uh, discourse that the pro-independent side has put forward, right? Um, so they have not achieved total hegemony yet, um, but uh, it's manifested in some ways as a generational divide. Um, you know, uh, younger people in Taiwan, younger generations, uh, uh, hew much more to this uh, pro-independence ideology in general. Um, and this is a consequence as well of, of just, you know, the length of time uh, for which Taiwan has been uh, sort of politically separated from, from mainland China. Um, so, you know, it, <clears throat> there, there is still a strong, you know, presence in, in the academy to some extent in the media, right, that um, uh, argues, uh, if not for full re reunification, then uh, at the very least for um, uh, a dialing down of cross-strait tensions. Uh, for understanding Taiwan as 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 part of you know a greater Sinosphere, right? Um, that uh, is is skeptical um, or outright uh, oppositional to U.S. efforts to uh, uh, stoke division. Um, but uh, I think it would be accurate to to describe that tendency as something of an embattled minority now. Um, and there you know were instances under the the prior administration of of Tsai Ing Wen. Um, of, of the DPP, of uh, uh, you know various like uh, TV and, and radio channels that had this political um, uh, in, uh, inclination being uh, being shut down, right? Um, on the whole, though, it, it still is uh, a debate that's being actively waged, and that most likely will will continue to be, you know, uh, probably with with higher intensity as uh, you know. Uh, the U.S. continues to stoke tensions um, in the region. And would you define uh, Taiwan uh, democracy right now? <laughs> Difficult question. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a good question because um, uh, you know mainstream media in the West seem very intent on characterizing Taiwan every time they bring it up. Uh, as a quote unquote vibrant democracy. In fact, like vibrant, not yes. only the democracy, but but but, but but they insist, they insist. Vibrant, that, vibrant. Uh, exactly. Yeah, there, there is like alive and kicking to a degree that is no longer the case uh, in in the West, right? And uh, this this certainly plays into the self image that the pro independence camp wants to um, uh, put forward as well, right? Uh, in that. You know the the way that they frame it is 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 that you know Taiwan is supposedly an object lesson in the capacity of Chinese or you know as they would put it you know sort of uh, uh, Chinese descended people um, for for democracy in explicit contrast with mainland China right uh, which they present as this benighted you know totalitarian dictatorship um, and. Uh, I suppose what I would say is that, you know, the, the formal trappings of multi-party liberal democracy uh, are there at an institutional level in Taiwan, right? Um, the uh, electoral sphere is somewhat constrained, you know, by its electoral system, which is first past the post and which really, uh, in practice, allows room for, for, for only two major parties. Um, but beyond, you know, those sorts of institutional questions, um, uh, I think the the history that I brought up earlier is vital to understand in this context because uh, Taiwan was only allowed to democratize after the pro-unification left, which had been the strongest opposition, especially at the popular level, to the Kuomintang dictatorship, was wiped out, uh, you know, through incredibly violent means um, under the White Terror during the Cold War, and uh, you know it was only that process that made Taiwanese society in some ways safe, you know, for for some semblance of democracy uh, on the terms that the U.S. set out, um, namely, you know, two bourgeois parties that are, uh, you know, both sort of equally anti-communist in their own way, right? Uh, neither of which will fundamentally challenge U.S. interests. And um, in, in, in some ways, the uh, continued insistence on characterizing Taiwan uh, as a formal democracy actually makes this problem worse, right? Um, 
because the internal dynamics of that political system, in fact, exacerbate uh, the you know exclusion of uh, bona fide anti-imperialists from the political sphere and their uh, sort of historical destruction as um, a meaningful political force. Um, since you mentioned it, um, I wanted to ask you about the um, Western propaganda on Taiwan. I'd like to mm -hmm. a bit insist on that point. Um, because the only propaganda that uh, you can hear uh, here is that uh, uh, the attempt of China um, to, uh, to, to an attempt on China to uh, take back uh, Taiwan uh, is just an act of imperialism uh, and uh, expansionism. Um, what do you think uh, that could be the main uh, argument uh, uh, to refute this kind of uh, this kind of uh, propaganda or this kind of argument? Yeah, so this particular uh, attack line is quite dangerous because it's phrased in a way to appeal to the Western left as well. Um, and in this regard, I think that there are several points that need to be brought up uh, in, in opposition to it. Um, one is uh, regarding the charge that this is a form of expansionism, right? Um, in fact, all countries on Earth recognize Taiwan as part of China. Um, even its uh, dwindling, you know, coterie of at this point 11, you know, UN member states that uh, recognize the ROC, the Republic of China, over the People's Republic of China, uh, still adhere to the One China principle. It's just that they believe the legitimate government of both mainland China and Taiwan is the one in Taipei, right? Um, and in this regard, you know, the ROC itself, uh, you know, considers Taiwan to be part of China, right? Um, so, so in this sense, um, the vast majority of the world um, considers the cross-strait dispute between, uh, you know, the governing authorities uh, in Taiwan and the government on mainland China as an internal affair for China. Um, and that's categorically not, you know, uh, an act of uh, aggressive expansion. Um, you know, outside China's borders. Uh, I think the charge of expansionism is uh, further revealed to be absurd when you think about the fact that um, the People's Republic of China has not fought a war since 1979. And, you know, in a, on, on top of the claim to Taiwan, it's territorial claims everywhere, actually, you know, whether you're looking at um, uh, the, you know, ongoing border dispute with India or uh, the dispute with several other countries in the South China Sea. Um, all of those territorial claims are uh, inherited from, and in fact, strictly more modest than those of the Republic of China, um, to which the People's Republic is the legitimate successor state, right? Um, you know, in particular in the South China Sea, where uh, the, the, you know, the ROC um, regime in Taiwan also, uh, <coughs> you know, is, is involved, right? the so-called nine dash line uh, that that uh, China asserts as its maritime boundary there is, is actually strictly more limited than than what uh, the, the ROC has historically asserted. And so those territorial claims mirror each other. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in, in, in this sense, um, charges that that China is acting in like, you know, a, a territorially expansionist way uh you know ignore the fact that, that that it's simply you know reasserting uh in fact strictly more modest claims than than that of uh, uh the the uh, country that has succeeded right and you know in this we can we can certainly discern a very strong uh uh you know anti-communist bias um and uh yeah like a, a singling out of china as a consequence of its challenge to u.s hegemony and the final point that I would raise in response to this particular attack line is that historically speaking, throughout virtually the entire 20th century, actually, Taiwan um, uh, was in fact not a, a target of so-called Chinese imperialism, but it was used as a launch pad for uh, imperialist, mil imperialist military aggression by Japan and then later by the United States against mainland China. Uh, that was in on the military side. And then if you think about um, imperialism as an economic phenomenon, right, 
uh, than, in fact, during the early reform and opening period in, in mainland China, when it sort of welcomed in uh, Taiwanese capital, um, uh, you know, as, as sort of part of the earliest wave of, of uh, foreign direct investment in the mainland. Um, uh, yeah, Taiwan, in fact, became something of a vehicle for value extraction from mainland Chinese labor into the imperial court, right? So on that side as well, uh, you know, considering Ty uh, mainland China's relationship with Taiwan as imperialist uh, is is just uh, in in objective contradiction to the facts. And um, and do you think that uh, the Taiwan case uh, can uh, can become similar to the Ukrainian case? Of course, there are lots of historical. Uh, differences but in the way particularly the US is approaching to those different cases maybe geopolitically we can see some uh, bias here y using it to, to to test the red lines and the mm. yeah yeah absolutely i think um you know there are some distinct uh, differences that are worth mentioning but but also strong uh, similarities especially in the rhetoric coming from uh, Western governments and Western media, uh, you know, surrounding the two situations. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the differences because I think they are worth um, mentioning. Uh, one is that, you know, as as already um, as I already mentioned, right, Taiwan is not recognized as an independent and sovereign state by any country. Um, you know, even even its remaining diplomatic allies consider it part of China, whereas Ukraine you know, uh, is is formally recognized uh, by all of the countries as an independent and sovereign state. Um, another difference is that, um, you know, with the exception of, of the Russian speaking parts of uh, eastern and southern Ukraine, um, uh, many of which have now been formally annexed to Russia, uh, the majority of Ukraine, that is West Ukraine, uh, is culturally and linguistically distinct from Russia, right? Um, uh, and this also is a major distinction from Taiwan, which in fact is more Han Chinese uh, in, you know, in terms of ethnicity than mainland China itself, right? Taiwan is about 95% uh, ethnic Han, mainland China is about 91 or 92%. Um, you know, the, the official dialect of, of government education in both places is Mandarin Chinese. Um, and in terms of, you know, what's sort of uh, uh, spoken at a popular level, um, you know, that's uh, the, the Minan or, or, or Hokkien dialect from Fujian, right? Uh, so in this sense, linguistically, Taiwan is, is, is more similar to the province of Fujian in mainland China across the, 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 the Taiwan Strait than Fujian is to its neighboring provinces in mainland China, right? Um, so that's another, another distinction. Um, but the similarities, I think, uh, are much more um, uh, meaningful in, in geopolitical terms. Uh, both Taiwan and Ukraine are uh, governed by de, fa uh, de facto by uh, very US-friendly regimes um, that are bent on sort of antagonizing and serving as forward bases for Western imperialist aggression against, uh, you know, their neighboring counter-hegemonic powers, you know, China and Russia, respectively. Um, both regimes are painted as democratic in Western media, uh, even though anti-imperialist forces within both societies have been violently repressed or eliminated. In Taiwan, this occurred mostly through the white terror during the Cold War. In Ukraine, it's been actively occurring since the Maidan coup in 2014. And, uh, you know, both Ukraine and Taiwan are heavily armed by the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and in a way that consciously tests the explicit red lines, uh, you know, as as you mentioned, um, uh, put forward by China and Russia, but they're they're armed in in such a way that they're expected essentially to serve as cannon fodder uh, in uh, in the case of hot war breaking out, as it has in Ukraine since 2022, right? Without explicit security guarantees, you know, that would come from being part of uh, a U.S. alliance, a U.S.-led alliance like NATO. Um, and in that sense, you know, the, the people of, of Ukraine and Taiwan, respectively, are expected essentially to, to do the brunt of the fighting while, you know, uh, the U.S. maintains a sort of careful st strategic ambiguity uh, about, about whether it would 
want to get involved uh, and thus escalate, you know, into a shooting war between two nuclear powers. And the, the, no, I wanted to understand if, uh, I mean, we, we have focused on a historical cultural point of view and uh, what, uh, how, why, I mean, Taiwan is so important from a geopolitical point of view, a military point of view also for mainland China. I mean, uh, why it is so uh, a huge red line that cannot be crossed? Yeah, um, a lot of this derives from uh, its geographical uh, and, and physical location, right? Uh, it is, uh, you know, by some measure, like the largest, uh, you know, island that, you know, is is anywhere near that close to the Chinese mainland. It's very strategically located. Um, and as as I mentioned, you know, in the past, uh, uh, during its period of, of colonial rule, Japan used it as a launch pad for uh, direct attacks on, um, you know, uh, the coast of, the, you know, the central and southern coast of China uh, during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Prior to that, um, you know, various Western imperialist designs on Taiwan going all the way back to the Dutch and Spanish period were, you know, intended essentially to exploit that strategic location in order to force open trade with, with mainland China. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's always been a direct threat to have an unfriendly, uh, uh, you know, regime in Taiwan, you know, uh, at one, one that was typically installed by uh, uh, imperialist aggressors. And, um, you know, this strategic location is obviously uh, something that weighs heavily on the minds of uh, U.S. strategists as well, right? Um, in, in, in terms of their, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, scheme since the Cold War period of militarily encircling China, um, through, you know, these three successive uh, island chains, as they're called, that, you know, are of increasing distance, uh, you know, from, from mainland China and, and essentially uh, uh, surround it, uh, you know, at least from the sea. Uh, Taiwan is, is essentially the linchpin of uh, the so-called first island chain, which extends, you know, all the way down from mainland Japan through Okinawa or Ryukyu, uh, through Taiwan uh, and then and then down through the Philippines and uh, and into the South China Sea, right? Um, and in that sense, uh, you know, the, the phrase that you know has often been deployed since uh, uh, I think it was it, it was first used by Douglas MacArthur in 1950 is that t Taiwan serves as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, um, and you know, uh, yeah. Uh, essentially, um, uh, yeah, like um, an ever-present, you know, base for imperialist aggressions against China. Um, in addition to that, another point that's often raised, uh, you know, particularly in, in Western um, analyses is the fact that uh, Taiwan is home to TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Um, which, uh, you know, basically with, with uh, strong state support and with uh, the blessing of the United States um, was allowed to occupy a uh, position in the, uh, you know, multi-trillion dollar semiconductor supply chain that's very crucial. It produces about 60% of all semiconducting chips and about 90% of the most high-end chips. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll often hear in Western media the line that, um, you know, this, this serves uh, as, as a, a, a shield, right, against armed reunification by, by, uh, by mainland China um, in that, you know, the, 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 the broader Chinese economy, much like any, any modern industrialized economy, relies heavily on, uh, you know, that, that supply of semiconductor chips. And there is some truth to that, but uh, I think that the degree to which that actually weighs in Chinese strategic considerations is is overplayed, right? Um, and on the U.S. side, there's so much obsession over it that it manifests in in occasional statements from U.S. politicians that, in the case of uh, armed an attempt at armed unification from China, the United States itself will go in and blow up TSMC. 
Uh, and, and this, of course, is not something that, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the Taiwanese are happy with, right? So, um, yeah, I would say that that th that those two um, features of of Taiwan in terms of its uh, spatial location and its uh, uh, position, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the the overall global supply chain are uh, are are the leading considerations in this regard. Now, because it was, it's also like after the peak reached with the August twenty twenty two. Uh, mission of uh, our dear friend uh, Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. It looks like, I mean, the, the tension is mm, 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 has been been brought under control somehow, and uh, the main point of tension is is shifting uh, south and no? towards the north of Philippines. Uh, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, we some sometimes, uh, like Otolina, we have uh, talked about this. Like the the if we, we if we if we have to imagine uh, a conflict, uh, uh, we will look more at North of Philippines than not at Thailand, at, at Taiwan after. I mean, uh, after the, the the 2022 travel of uh, Nancy Pelosi. What do you think about this? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question. I don't know if I would um, uh, necessarily separate the two uh, as as strictly because you know, as I mentioned, uh, U.S. geostrategic planners really view both Taiwan and the Philippines as part of the so-called first island chain, and in that sense, the uh, you know recent moves to um, you know open new U.S. bases in the Philippines, right, uh, which you know, occurred after the inauguration of Bomba Marcos as the president of the Philippines. Um, they're really of a piece with, uh, you know, the the overall um, uh, shifts in the disposition of, of U.S. military forces in the region after 1979. Uh, because prior to that, when the U.S. Uh, recognized the Taipei Kuomintang regime as uh, the legitimate government of all of China, it had uh, basically, a security treaty with with that regime, right? That allowed U.S. troops to be stationed in Taiwan uh, directly. That expired in 1979, and so uh, you know, coincidentally with that, um, you had to the northeast of Taiwan um, a strengthening of the U.S. military presence in Okinawa, right? Which formally reverted to uh, Japanese sovereignty against the wishes of much of its population, um, but you know, where, where the U.S. base presence was not just maintained, but strengthened. And then south, you know, to the south, you have the same phenomenon in the Philippines, right? So, uh, yeah, I think I think it's all part of the same strategy, actually. And and, and the same is true for U.S. machinations in the in the South China Sea. Uh, it, it's all part of like a coherent strategy of encirclement. And, uh, you know, the the, you know, specific Locus of that, in terms of, of of where you know U.S. troops are actually located, has has just sort of shifted uh, over the decades based on geopolitical exigencies. Though I will note that we've had very recent news just earlier this month that uh, you know uh, U.S. Army Green Berets are now going to be stationed permanently, not specifically on the island of Taiwan, but even closer to mainland China, on the ROC-held uh, island of Jinmen or Kinmen. Uh, which is just several miles off the coast or several kilometers off the coast of mainland China. Uh, and they'll be stationed there permanently in what is supposedly a training capacity. But, you know, as as an escalation, this is this is, um, you know, pretty blatant as well. Ale. Yes, uh, no, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you if uh, also in your uh, in your feelings, in your uh, personal opinion, if you think that a peaceful reunification uh, is actually possible um, and uh, if uh, in the long term uh, would be actually better for uh, Taiwanese people uh, to reunify with the mainland or motherland, yes. Yeah, that is that is a very co good question. Um, <clears throat> uh, in in a word, I would say uh, in the very long term that the answer is yes to both questions. Um, 
in the immediate term, uh, there are a lot of obstacles to this. Uh, the foremost among them being uh, that the U.S., which still, you know, is is the dominant, certainly military power in the world, um, though its economic uh, dominance is is being increasingly challenged, uh, would simply not allow such a move, right? Um, and uh, you know, in terms of social dynamics uh, at a popular level in Taiwan, you know, this is kind of uncomfortable to admit, but it's true that in recent decades, uh, you know, the level of support for reunification and the level of self-identification, you know, uh, with China has measurably declined, especially among the younger generation. Uh, this is a product of, you know, the de campaign and the artificial construction of a Taiwanese identity separate to that of China, um, which I, uh, which has been led, right, by the pro-independence camp, by the DPP, uh, which I talked about earlier. Uh, however, you know, parallel with all of this, uh, I would say that the level of cultural and economic integration across the strait uh, has been sort of proceeding uh, and, and deepening, right? Um, uh, in many ways, it does constitute one sort of common cultural sphere. If you look at, you know, the realms of, of music, of, of film, of pop culture, um, and, uh, you know, cross-strait people-to-people exchanges, um, which, uh, you know, ramped up dramatically in the early 2000s, uh, are now recovering from the, the zero COVID um, uh, period, right? So, so those are sort of secular trends that are pointing uh, in, in a positive direction in that sense. Um, and, you know, at, at a geopolitical level, we do know that U.S. hegemony is declining um, and that this is producing increasing popular, popular disillusionment with Western liberalism in much of the world. Uh, Taiwan, for now, you know, appears to be something of an exception to that, but I don't think that that will, you know, remain the case indefinitely, uh, especially as the declining empire, you know, um, sort of acts out in, in more and more violent and alienating ways, right? Um, and shows, as, as is the case in Ukraine, that, uh, you know, uh, really hitching your wagon to, to that particular project is, is a losing proposition and in many ways a fatal one. So I think that will also, uh, you know, over the long term, create more positive conditions for peaceful reunification. Um, I, uh, I would mention as well that, um, you know, there is still a small minority in Taiwan that belongs to what we would call the pro-unification left that sort of carry forward the analysis of the, you know, uh, originally very strong communist movement uh, that that was almost fully wiped out um, by the white terror. Uh, and this is embodied today in the Labour Party of Taiwan, uh, you know, which we've quoted extensively um, in our resource list. And uh, they have a program for left uh, unification, which is very compatible with uh, the uh, one country, two system scheme that um, the, the mainland Chinese government has, you know, consistently put forward, which would essentially, uh, you know, uh, gradually sort of integrate uh, Taiwan, you know, into the broader Chinese polity, um, you know, in a way that that sort of preserves its uh, substantial degree of autonomy in, you know, the political and economic domains, uh, and even to a limited extent in the diplomatic one, right? Um, this has always been uh, an exceptionally sort of generous offer. Um, and essentially what the Labour Party says is, is that, uh, you know, this is the most viable scheme for reunification, but that it, uh, it must be directed by the working class, you know, on both sides of the strait and not by capitalist interests, which is largely what happens uh, in, in Hong Kong and, and in Macau, right, which at least in the case of Hong Kong has had, uh, you know, quite negative effects and, and required, you know, more, uh, more direct interventions, especially since 2019. So um, I would say that that is an analysis that we broadly align with as well. Um, and, you know, that, that we still maintain hope, uh, in, in the long-term viability of that path. And yeah, since you, since you, men since you mentioned the capitalism and, uh, different social and development models, uh, I'd like you, I'd like to ask you that, uh, um, many, many analysts see the new Cold War, as you also call it, uh, uh, as a clash between uh, two different uh, imperialism, 
the Chinese and US one, uh, just aiming to global uh, hegemony. Uh, but uh, it can also be it can also be uh, read as a confrontation, uh, as you mentioned, between two different uh, uh, model of uh, social model and developed models. Um, what do you think about it? Yeah, so this will not come as a surprise, but we uh, definitely reject the you know analysis that frames this as as a clash between two rival imperialisms, both of which are aiming at global hegemony. Um, and this is because China explicitly does not aim at global hegemony. Um, even if you limit your analysis to the, the military sphere, right, uh, what's often characterized as, as China's power projection, even, in, even within the region, right, where it is undoubtedly the, the, the strongest power, is primarily defensive in nature. It's a response to the fact that it's encircled by around 400 U.S. military bases. Um, and, uh, you know, various manifestations of this, like territorial disputes in the South China Sea or like the Belt and Road Initiative, um, are really, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not offensive in nature, right? They're uh, intended to avoid, uh, you know, the strangleholds that the U.S. could in principle apply uh, in order to choke off China's uh, maritime trade, for example, in the Straits of Malacca, right, or in the, South, in the rest of the South China Sea. Um, you know, these are, uh, you know, extremely sensitive uh, points that, you know, essentially China is, is, is trying to build, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, like, like an extensive overland and overseas uh, network in order to, um, in order to avoid economic strangulation, right, uh, uh, through those pressure points. And the underlying principle behind those products and behind China's overall um, diplomatic disposition uh, at an international level is collective security and international cooperation, um, you know, between all countries with mutual respect for sovereignty, right? And this is overall within a non-hegemonic, uh, democratic, and, and increasingly multipolar world order, um, where, you know, there is space for uh, different peoples and different nations to pursue their own developmental models, right? Um, this is one that, you know, as we can see at a domestic level in China, uh, uh, you know, incorporates its own model, which, which, is, which is very distinct uh, from, from that of the West, right? And which is grounded in a long-term vision for socialist construction, um, albeit one that, you know, for uh, at least several decades to come, you know, will, will, will involve uh, substantial cultivation of, of, of uh, you know, a market economy of a private sector, right? Um, but but uh, not, you know, a capitalist class that can uh, act autonomously and, and uh, capture uh, the state to wield in its own interests. Um, but that's simply the developmental model, you know, that, that uh, China uh, wants to maintain for itself and to preserve the space in order to maintain for itself, right? It's not trying to impose it on, on any other uh, people or any other country. And this stands in, in very dramatic contrast with what the United States likes to call its uh, rule-based order, uh, which is a very uh, thin cover for uh, maintaining its unilateral and arbitrary domination over the world. Um, we see this, of course, in this long and unbroken historical record of you know, invasions, occupations, proxy wars, and coups against most countries around the globe. And especially now in its current, you know, full-throated um, diplomatic and material support for the Israeli genocide in Gaza. Right, right. Um, to conclude, uh, I wanted to ask you if, um, uh, do you think that uh, uh, with the Chao Collective, uh, you are actually convincing uh, Western people and especially uh, American uh, uh, about your uh, reasonable uh, arguments uh, or uh, do you think that uh, it's going to be uh, even more difficult uh, in the next years? Well, we optimist. <laughs> Are you optimist or not? <laughs> of course, of course. No, this is a question that, that we ask ourselves all the time, right? Um, I would say that we certainly hope so and that, uh, you know, since our formation in uh, 2020, at you know the height of uh, of you know the COVID pandemic and the accompanying wave of of xenophobia and you know anti-China propaganda that swept across the West, um, 
that our work has had a qualitative impact uh, at our main target audience, which is broadly speaking the left in Western countries. Um, I think that our interventions on uh, you know a variety of issues, um, among them, uh, you know both both various domains of Chinese domestic domestic policy, but also uh, on you know the controversies surrounding Xinjiang, surrounding Hong Kong, right? Um, you know, surrounding all these other uh, more sort of peripheral areas uh, 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 within China that that uh, are consciously used by Western imperialism as 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 pressure points, right? And as uh, as vehicles for for its uh, its its hybrid war and its product of encirclement of China. Um, I think I think those interventions have uh, helped to qualitatively shift uh, the discourse within the broader left, uh, especially uh, in Anglophone countries, the United States in particular, right, um, in a direction that is uh, more favorable to China, or, or at the very least, that uh, does not dismiss out of hand, right, uh, analyses coming out of the broad Chinese left, and um, particularly those uh, segments of it that, uh, the, 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 the vast majority of it that is not you know, dissident in nature, right? That's not, um, uh, you know, automatically predisposed to to attack the government, and which sort of prior to 2020, I would say, uh, uh, you know, was systematically excluded from from uh, you know even Western left analysis of China. So in that respect, I think we have had a measurable impact, and we hope to continue that with the release of this resource list, which is our first major piece of uh, long form writing that we've put out in around two years. Um, you know, of course, uh, the the US propaganda campaign against uh, China, you know, and more material instantiations of its hybrid war have continued to pace in those two years. Um, you know, we, we do regret not having been able to uh, uh, muster the capacity during that time for, uh, you know, interventions of the same scale and volume as, as we had previously, but we, we have been hardened by the fact that even during that period, there are so many other outlets, right, um, that have sort of taken up the mantle in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, in that sense, sort of with or without us, uh, there, there is a strong, I think, like anti-imperialist pull now within the Western left uh, that, you know, whose who's, who's, uh, views on China have to be considered um, uh, you know, as, as, as part of the picture, right? Um, and, and which is gaining increasing strength. You know, the practical impact of that on policy is something that's a little hard to speak to, right? We're, uh, we're up against uh, a very, very um, determined imperialist juggernaut, which, uh, you know, seemingly holds uh, all the reins of power over uh, the mainstream media, uh, to say nothing of you know the direct coercive power of of you know uh, of the government and the military, um, and uh, you know the the the, the ch you know I would say the the changing terms of discourse uh, on on the left per se uh, have not necessarily been reflected yet in the halls of power, right? Um, in terms of breaking the bipartisan anti-China consensus that exists in the United States. And, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, it appears for many European countries uh, uh, to some extent exists as well. But, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, uh, we, we, we take as our reference point uh, the, you know, anti-imperialist solidarity movements uh, that existed in the West, for example, in the era of the Vietnam War and of the tide of national liberation struggles that accompanied it, and which we know, uh, you know, did have, uh, you know, a very measurable effect on um, thwarting, you know, the the uh, murderous and genocidal impulses of of the U.S. war machine, uh, you know, in that in that particular uh, act of aggression, and and in others, right? Um, it required mass mobilization on a scale that. Uh, we really have not seen uh, for, for some time, but which we are seeing now, I think, in response to, uh, you know, the, the Israeli genocide in Gaza at a, at a sustained level that is quite inspiring to see. And um, we think that, you know, with 
the capacity for popular anti-imperialist mobilization that uh, that we witnessed in this in the last several months, right? That that many of the ingredients are there, you know, in 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 the um, uh, in the very likely eventuality of you know increased military aggression against China uh, for our intervention at the discursive level within the left to have an actual um, meaningful practical impact on the ground. Right, right. So there's always hope. There's always hope. <laughs> Thank I you, for know, Giuliano. If uh, you, if you have other questions. Uh... No, 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 no. I, I, I want, I want Charles uh, to come back again to uh, talk uh, on other topics because on this one was about Taiwan. So I think one hour or more of interview. It's, it's enough. But uh, I, I absolutely hope you will come to visit us very soon to talk about something else uh, on your work because uh, I, I follow Chao since uh, four years now and uh, they, they have done a lot of good research and good communication. So there are a lot of topics to cover together. Thank you so much, Charles. It's been a great, great, great pleasure. Thank you as well. Yeah, I would love to come back. And in fact, I'm right now working on another uh, long piece regarding uh, China and Palestine. Um, you know, this this covers various facets of, of that relationship from, uh, you know, China's uh, direct support for Palestinian armed struggle in the Mao period um, to sort of the ram ramifications of, you know, of, of modern day multipolarity and of China's challenge to U.S. hegemony, you know, at a regional level. Uh, uh, at, a, at the discursive sphere in terms of the information war, right? Um, uh, I'm looking as well at the uh, implications of China's moves toward digital sovereignty for the, the shaping of narratives, right, around, uh, around Palestine. Um, and uh, yeah, I've uncovered a lot of, of really sort of fascinating material through the historical research there that I'm very excited to share. So when that piece comes out, which it should in several weeks, I will be very happy to come back. That's Perfect. great. Absolutely. Perfect. That's great. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Charles. Thank you very thank much, you. Charles. Uh, thank you to Chao Collective. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Uh, see you in the next episode. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.